Thanks. You know, I, I, I teach here at the University of the Fraser Valley, and I, I, I've never had a standing ovation, I can tell you that for sure. And it's, it's, like, it's nice to have that at the start of a talk. Uh, so it's also great to be here in Abbotsford in beautiful Fraser Valley, and, and the Fraser Valley is all about food, so I thought I'd talk to you about food today. And you're probably all aware of the Canada Food Guide. Uh, the Canada Food Guide are recommendations for a healthy diet, and they've been around for 30 or 40 years. They redo them about every 10 years, and we'll have a new Canada Food Guide in about another year or so. And so it begs the question, are these recommendations making us healthy? And so when I pivoted in my career and started looking at uh, nutrition science, I looked for the evidence that underpins the recommendations in the Canada Food Guide. I looked everywhere, and I couldn't find any science. There's lots of opinion, there's lots of lobby groups, but there was no science. So the conclusion I came to is the answer to the question is no. And I, I have to kind of apologize to all my students from the past because I taught the recommendations in the Canada Food Guide for about 30 years. And I, I, I apologize because that was a mistake. I'm a scientist, I'm a proud scientist. I didn't look at the principal research. When I did, I couldn't find it. But I did find something interesting. I found out that those recommendations are actually making us sick. And I'm going to share that with you today, and I hope by the end of the talk you'll think differently about what you put on the end of your fork. Here's my mantra, the ketogenic diet is medicine for life. And I mean that in many ways. A uh, ketogenic diet is something that is based on the different levels of macronutrients you have in your diet. So I'll just take a moment and explain those for you. We have to do a little bit of background on basic nutrition science. So macronutrients are the things that give us calories, the energy in our food, and also the building blocks. And they come in three forms, and only three forms. Proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And I'm sure you all know this. Now, the, the presently recommended diet, the standard Western diet we call it, looks something like this. It's about 15% protein, uh, mostly carbohydrates, and they, as you know, they really want you to limit fat as much as possible. And so because there's only three things, you can only eat about 15, well, 20 to 25% of your uh, calories from protein before you run into protein poisoning issues. So if you're only eating maybe 15% of your calories uh, from protein and, and another 30% limited for fats, then the rest has to be carbohydrates. So this is what we call a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. A ketogenic diet, on the other hand, is quite different. In fact, it's contrary. Uh, it's moderate in protein, it has as few carbs as possible, uh, and so what we're really doing is swapping that carbohydrate load for a fat load. And this, I know, sounds contrary to all of you, because we've been told for 40 years that eating fat is bad, that fat is bad, that fat makes you fat, fat will give you cardiovascular disease, and I can tell you conclusively that is not true. There's never been any science that supports that, and I'll show you what the science does support. First of all, we have to look a little bit at what carbohydrates are. And there's really two forms. I'm talking about the non-fiber carbohydrates. There's sugars, and sugars, there's a couple of different types. They come in the, the simple sort of building block versions, glucose and, and, and fructose, uh, called monosaccharides, which means one sugar. And you can bind these together into pairs, and you get disaccharides. Sucrose is the most common form. That's your table sugar. And then there's another form of carbohydrate that you're familiar with, which is starch. And uh, starch is really just sugars joined together. And I don't think a lot of people really understand that. It's just a whole bunch of glucose molecules connected together. And so when we digest those, they're called polysaccharides. It means many sugars. And when we digest those and absorb those, it doesn't get absorbed as starch into our blood. It gets absorbed as sugar. So it raises our blood sugar level. And we raise our blood sugar level. That's also the blood glucose level. Sugars and starches both, both raise blood sugar. And here's another interesting point. There are no essential carbohydrates. There are essential amino acids, which make up the proteins. There are essential fatty acids, which make up fats. When I say essential, that means you have to get it from your diet. We can't make those internally. There are no essential carbohydrates. You can happily make all the carbohydrate you need in your liver as needed uh, and be perfectly healthy with no carbohydrate in your diet. So what happens when you eat carbohydrates? And you know, we talk about you know, farm to fork. This is sort of a fork to fat story. So when you, when you eat carbohydrates, this is a, a graph that shows uh, blood glucose levels over a single day. 
So uh, this is on a high carbohydrate diet, and you can see after breakfast, especially after lunch and after dinner, you get this rise in, in uh, blood glucose levels because of this starch and sugar in, in the high carbohydrate diet. If we look at a low carbohydrate diet, we see, as you might expect, much more moderate changes in uh, glucose levels, but also notice that it's much lower all through the day. Now, this is important because the next thing I want to show you is the same sort of event during the day, except looking at blood insulin levels. Now, insulin is a hormone that's secreted by the pancreas when you have sugar in your blood, and it allows the cells to uptake that sugar into the cells where they can either be metabolized for energy or stored as fat. So let's look at what happens on these two diets uh, during the day. And you'll see they're quite dramatically different. Now, this is important. Notice the high-carb diet, the insulin levels are very high the entire day. They only drop off at night. And uh, on the, on the low-carbohydrate diet, which would be a ketogenic-type diet, uh, again, much more moderate levels of insulin. Now, this is important because high levels, chronically high levels of insulin in the blood will lead to a condition called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is really a pre-diabetic condition that can lead to diabetes. So you don't want to have excessive levels in the blood, uh, excessive uh, insulin levels in the blood for long periods of time. The other thing that's interesting about insulin, it's kind of like a traffic cop in your system. So when there's high levels of glucose and therefore high levels of insulin, what that tells the insulin to do, the insulin directs the glucose into fat. And as long as the insulin levels are high, that fat goes into the fat cells and it can't get out. So if you're on a chronically high carbohydrate diet and have chronically high uh, insulin levels, you're just going to be storing fat and you won't be burning it. On the other hand, if your insulin levels are low because your blood sugar level is low, then you're going to be burning those sugars, and mostly in the brain and the heart. So let's see what happens in mammals. So look at these mice. Now these mice, this is very important. You can see there's two of them there. There's a little guy and there's a big guy. So the little guy and the big guy are eating exactly the same amount of food and exactly the same quality of food for eight months. The only difference is the big guy was given daily injections of a low level of insulin that would raise the blood insulin levels to a level we would call hyperinsulinemia. So this is the same thing that happens on a high carbohydrate diet. You have high chronic levels of insulin, and that, that traffic cop tells the blood sugar to go to fat and not be burned, and you can see the difference over eight months in a mouse. But that's a mouse. Let's see what happens in humans. Well, this is kind of the grand experiment we've been doing for the last 40 years. We told you for the last 40 years to eat a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. And you can see what's happened. The evidence is in. This is the United States data. It's similar in Canada. We're a little bit behind, but we're catching up. 72% uh, of American adults over age 18 are either obese or overweight. 72% of Americans are obese or overweight. And look when that started. It started when we issued the very first dietary guidelines in the United States in 1980. And it's accelerated since then. And you can see it's dropping off now. And so, you know, some people, oh, it's excited. We're dropping off. But because everybody who's going to get obese is obese now. So we're, we're reaching a threshold point. Look at this diagram here. Now, what's going to happen here? You have obesity in the United States from the Centers of Disease Control data. And as it gets darker, those are higher rates of obesity. And on the right, is diabetes rates. And you'll see diabetes and obesity go hand in hand. One follows the other because as you become insulin resistant, you become obese. And it takes about 10 years of insulin resistance before you start showing signs of what we would call diabetes. So starting in 1994, now again, it's, it's obesity on the left and diabetes rates on the right. And watch how they parallel each other. And watch how frighteningly quick, this is only a 15 year period, how frighteningly quick and completely comprehensive this obesity. And, and by the way, Canada, is following suit. You can see it starts in the south and the midwest, and it spreads throughout the entire continental US, plus Alaska and Hawaii eventually. So I have a model for chronic disease that I call the axis of illness. And uh, it consists of these three elements, insulin resistance, which I have mentioned, obesity, you know about, and also inflammation. This is the kind of chronic inflammation you get as you age uh, due to high-carbohydrate diets and due to other disease factors. These all 
work to make each other worse. We call it synergistically make each other worse. So it's kind of a vicious circle. So once it starts, once you start becoming insulin resistant, inflamed and obese, they just make each other worse and worse and worse over time until you end up with chronic disease. So what happens when we put a high carbohydrate diet on there is they all get collectively worse much faster and we end up with the chronic diseases that plague us. About 70% of chronic disease is due to these three factors. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and even Alzheimer's. So if we look at the uh, uh, ketogenic diet versus uh, the standard Western diet, we have some good news. It turns out that if you adopt a ketogenic diet, you can actually reverse a lot of the chronic disease that plagues us, and it actually happens quite quickly. And uh, we call this state nutritional ketosis. So some of you may have heard of ketoacidosis, which is associated with diabetes. Not the same thing. These are ketone levels much lower, and it turns out the ketone itself is actually a superfuel. It's kind of a super molecule that has all kinds of health benefits. So this nutritional ketosis puts you in a, on a low-carbohydrate diet on a, in a constant healthy state that actually counteracts the factors that uh, cause chronic disease. So if we now look at this axis of illness, these same three factors, obesity, <coughs> insulin resistance, and inflammation, on a low-carbohydrate diet, so we take carbohydrate out of the diet, then what happens is those three factors are all greatly reduced. And we see this happen within weeks. Uh, and then, of course, as a result, much diminished levels of chronic disease. So the incidence and the severity is, is decreased. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the therapeutic benefits of uh, ketogenic diets. This is the science that's being conducted now at research centers all over the world by really top-level scientists. So this is recent nutritional science. And it really is a revolution in nutrition because we're now realizing that the guidelines we gave you 40 years ago are actually dead wrong. They're, they're upside down. And so now we're putting people on high-fat high diets and, and to see what happens to them. So epilepsy, ketogenic diets have been used for epilepsy for over 100 years. And it resolves epilepsy in about 50% of cases. And this means that patients don't have to take medication for it. Uh, also diabetes. Uh, recent studies last year show that we can reverse the insulin resistance that causes diabetes by 75% in four weeks. 50% of type 2 diabetics are in complete reversal. We would call it remission. They have no more, they don't need to take any more medication. They have no more signs of diabetes. By the way, they also lose 20 or 30 pounds of fat because you're burning fat all the time. And 90% of people in the studies reduce or eliminate their need for medications like metformin and insulin. Very, very dramatic studies. These are, these are uh, 2018 studies. Cardiovascular disease as well. Uh, cardiovascular disease is, is, is mostly based on the inflammation uh, part of the axis of illness. It's an inflammatory disease. It's not really due to fat in your diet. It's due to inflammation in your blood vessels. And because the diet is naturally anti-inflammatory, it reduces all of the indicators for cardiovascular disease dramatically and very rapidly as well. But I really want to talk to you about cancer today too, because we think that ketogenic diets could be very important in treating cancer. And I want to say it's not a cure for cancer, but it, is, it appears to be, in the preliminary studies, a very effective co-treatment along with the standard of care. So to do that, I'm going to give you a little illustration, and, and I'm going to use a little analogy of, of, of a garden that you're all familiar with. So you have a garden that has the flowers and plants you want to have in it. And plants, because they don't need to eat, they, they make the glucose from sunlight through photosynthesis. Um, and uh, so you want the plants to grow, but unfortunately there's also weeds in there too. And as you know, if you just let the garden go and you don't tend to it, the weeds will suddenly outcompete the plants. So in this analogy, the plants are like your healthy body cells, and then the weeds are kind of like the cancer cells. And uh, something that you need to be aware of is that for most cancers, those cells eat glucose. And they eat glucose like crazy. They're, they don't have the same metabolic flexibility as your other cells. They can't use fats or, carbo or, fats or uh, proteins for fuel. So they have to use glucose. So they'll concentrate glucose 100 to 200 times. In fact, that's how we image tumors, with glucose. So what happens on a high-carbohydrate diet is you're actually increasing the amount of glucose in the system. And because these cancer cells eat glucose, it's something called the Warburg effect. For Otto, Otto Warburg, who won the uh, Nobel Prize for that in 1931, you're actually giving it more food, giving the cancer cells more of the food they crave. And when you raise blood sugar levels, you raise insulin levels, and that's kind of like the fertilizer. The hyperinsulinemia 
is a, is a growth factor. So you're giving cancer cells all the food and all the growth factor it needs to grow, and so cancer is enhanced, and in the end, the weeds win. Now, the great news about a ketogenic diet is it kind of turns this all on its head. So if we now look at the same scenario in a ketogenic diet, by the way, we, make, we have tumor cells growing all the time. Our immune system is what rids us of those tumor cells. So we need a vigilant immune system. So what happens on a ketogenic diet is we actually kind of we dim the sunlight. We limit the amount of carbohydrate and glucose. And when you do that, you also limit the growth factor, the insulin, in your blood as well. And so the growth of cancer cells is either prevented or limited. Now, what we've also shown in very preliminary studies at the BC Cancer Research Center is that we, we're seeing an enhanced immune response as well. So if you think of the immune response as like a, 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 weed, a weed eater or a weed whacker, um, what, we're, what we're finding is that that weed whacker is kind of turbocharged on a ketogenic diet, and so that helps to, uh, to uh, clear the cancer cells and return us to good health. And we're seeing, my study is on uh, women with metastatic breast cancer, and we're seeing dramatic improvement in 100% of the patients within six weeks. It's not a cure, but we're seeing regression of tumors in all of those women in six weeks. So to leave you, uh, I love this ancient uh, Ayurvedic proverb, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When diet is correct, medicine is, no, is of no need. Ketogenic diet, medicine for life, that's an idea worth sharing.